at different points, I had different um, feelings. There were times I was anxious. There were times I was afraid. There were times I was, I was scared. You know, there's afraid and there's being scared. I was scared. I was scared for the future of my company. I was scared for the future of everybody working with me because I thought, what is going to happen to everyone? And what's going to even happen to this business? Can this business survive this pandemic? Welcome to the Think Splendid YouTube channel. My name is Lynn Stevens, and I'm the founder and CEO of Think Splendid, where we provide business strategy for luxury wedding and hospitality brands. In celebration of 15 years in business, I'm sitting down with 20 wedding industry leaders from around the world to discuss the realities of owning an event business in 2020. These splendid conversations are honest, candid, and authentically optimistic. In this episode, I chat with Funke Bucknor Obrute, the founder of Zafire Events, a luxury event planning company based in Lagos, Nigeria. Funke and I talk about the changes she made in her business in order to survive the pandemic, why she structured her companies to stand alone as their own individual brands instead of having one vertically integrated company, why she considers conferences a worthwhile investment, and more. I also want to note that this conversation was recorded before the end SARS movement and protests against police brutality in Nigeria began. This movement is important to Funke and she has been an active participant in the protests. If you're unfamiliar with these current events in Nigeria, you can visit Funke's Instagram page to learn more about her involvement and why this matters. We at Think Splendid stand with Funke and everyone in Nigeria fighting for justice. Here's my conversation with Funke. Enjoy. My first degree was law, a BL in um, law. And after my degree, while I was in, in, in university, I'd always, you know, I had an interest. I just always loved organizing events. But, you know, at that time, it wasn't, this was about 18 years ago. It wasn't something that was very popular. It was, in fact, it wasn't something that every, anybody did or we knew how to. I mean, we had always planned events, we had always organized things, but we didn't put a name to it and say, oh, it was this professional or it was this way. So while I was in law school, this is what you do after you go to university, you go to law school, everybody has to go to law school, of course. So while I was in law school, I started organizing events for a few of my friends. I helped a few of my friends plan. And I said to myself, I think I may want to do this. But at that time, I wasn't sure. So after law school in Nigeria, where I come from in West Africa, there is um, a compulsory one year that, that everybody, whenever you finish university, you must work almost for the, for the government. It's, a, it's, it's called National Youth Service. So you do it for one year and it's compulsory. So I said to myself, okay, maybe um, law would be something that I would love. Let me go and work in a law firm during this period. Because it's mandatory, you have to do it. But you can choose wherever you want to do it. And I went to work in this law firm for three weeks. And I said to myself, no, this isn't working. Law isn't for me. And I left and I went to work in an advertising agency. Because at that time, I still wasn't really clear and sure about what I wanted to do. Because event planning and event production was very new. In fact, it was almost rare. Nobody else was doing it, save for maybe one person. So I didn't, I wasn't sure if that was a path. So I went to work in the advertising agency. But while I was working there, I started planning events for my friends. So my friends were getting married, their sisters were getting married, and I started helping them plan. And that was how I realized, you know what, I need to go and do this fully. So I left after the year and I went to start my own company. And that was my journey into event planning. You have a multifaceted company with a lot of things happening under one roof. Can you talk a little bit about your decision to do that instead of just straight planning? Because you do the design, the planning, rentals, like every, I know you yes. have yes. different facets yes. of it. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, you know, as you, as a business grows, I started out as an event planner. Um, our company, a fire event, started out as a full event planning company. But as a business grows, you, always, you find out that you, the, the needs of your clients change and your clients want different things at different times. Uh, one, our vision is to be an all-inclusive event planning company, you know, a solution provider. And we realized that with our vision, we needed to have different 
branches to cater to different types of clients. So we have the event planning arm, which is a fire event. We have the deco arm, deco and design arm, which is deco by Fortula. And all these businesses are run by different people. So the deco by Fortula is a design and deco arm. We have the rental part of the business, which is 1001 Lux Rentals. Um, we have the deco by Fortula Rentals as well. We have, um, we have that. We have the training school. So we have the Zafaya training school that, you know, it's like an academy for event planners from all over the world and especially Africa. We have that school. So, you know, it's like there were different things at different times and there were different needs that we saw in the market that made us say, you know what, we need to create brands, different brands and different companies for this and create solutions for this. And that's how we were able to do that. And that's why we did that. What advantages came from putting them under different names and having different people run them because that's one strategy. And I know another strategy that's often common in events is to have everything under the same name. And that can sometimes get complicated, but I think there are pros and cons to each approach. So what made you decide to do that one? I, I like that. There are pros and cons to each one. So I needed each of these companies to be independent. Uh, because I found out that when, if, if it came under the fire, everybody would either want to use us for something. So is it that they, they would say, okay, you know what? Don't plan, just decorate. Oh no, no. Okay. No, no, no. Are you sure you'd be able to, um, do the rentals? Are you sure you'd be able to plan? Are you sure you'd be able to? And I like, you know, I said to myself, no, I want each of these companies to also service other event professionals. So the deco arm. If it's not under Zafaya, you don't feel like you're using a planner. You're using a decorator. If you're um, in the rental part, you're using a rental company. Um, the training school is under Zafaya, so that's a bit different. But every other one has the different names, and that's because I wanted them to be independent of the Zafaya brand. Of course, what are the cons of this? The cons of this means that they must, they must market. So they're not under the brand name of Zafaya, so they have to fight for their market. You know, but in order to fight for their market, they become independent and stand alone. So they are not identified by the Zafaya name, but they are identified. They know that people know that they have the Zafaya DNA, but they're also independent of Zafaya. So it doesn't need me to be there. I don't need to be there. The business can run by itself and it can run with all these other individuals, you know, running it. And I don't have to be there in any meeting or in any transaction to make it succeed. So that was, I did it also for my own independence and peace of mind as well. <laughs> <laughs> Can't put a price on that. With the, with the pandemic and everything happening, I know you're still doing some events and taking precautions, but can you talk a little bit about how that's impacted the industry in Nigeria and also your business a little bit? So the pandemic came and disrupted you know, and came and disrupted so many things. Um, in Nigeria, we're a country that we organize concerts, parties, weddings. We do events all, every day, every day of the week. We celebrate in large numbers. We have concerts of over 10,000 people. We do, you know, parties, celebrations, birthdays, daily. But this pandemic came and for like three, four months, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't do anything. It disrupted. I mean, apart from the event planners, apart from the venue owners, it affected every single sphere. The, the, the technicians, the laborers, the florists, the, 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 the workers, you know, the, the, the hostesses, um, all the waiting staff. The, the um, caterers, the drinks, I mean, the caterers were able to even maneuver. Well, you know, every other person, um, down to the electricians, those that work on the videographers and photographers that work every day and rely on daily weekend jobs, daily jobs to make a living. The makeup artists. If guests, whenever they're going to an event in Nigeria, they always have makeup artists on standby. They were not, nobody was going to any party. Nobody was going to any event. So all over the country, in every state in Nigeria, 
there were serious issues because people were not earning. Some people have not even earned an income in six months. Some have been able to, some have not. Because for events are not happening. So it's really affected Nigeria. But then it affected, of course, my company. Now, for a few months, we were not doing anything. We couldn't do anything because there was even no direction. First of all, we were scared of, um, people were scared of their health. It was a health and safety issue because you needed to even be alive to even plan any event or organize any event. So we were very scared. So everybody was afraid. Um, but later we realized and said, you know what? We need to earn a living. We need to eat. We need to, a lot of events got canceled. We had events that got canceled. In fact, we had an event that was happening the day after they, they announced the lockdown. So we were already at the event working and then we had to close the event. So we, 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 we were greatly impacted. You know, events were canceled. We had over 14 or 15 events that got canceled or postponed actually, not canceled. Some were canceled. Some have been moved to next year. So, and then of course you are now thinking about how do you even do refunds? So financially, it's really, really impacted my business. It's impacted other businesses. What has helped? I mean, what, has, what helped was innovation thinking. And also, luckily, I, we had savings. So our savings, we had uh, uh, money that we had kept aside for projects. We had to use it. And so, we, and then we, we also cut salaries. So instead of paying 100%, we started paying 70% of our staff salary. We didn't let anybody go, but we still paid. And everybody came together. We had the buy-in of our team, of our staff. We had to communicate. Every, you know, there was always that constant communication with the team, with my staff, and everybody just constantly communicating with them and talking to them and assuring them that, you know what, we're in this together. You know, and everybody was really great, but it really greatly impacted. And it's still, because, I mean, we're not working, we're, 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 now we're doing virtual events, but at that time, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't do anything at all. So it did really impact the business. Right. How big is your company like how many employees do you have so at um zafaya the planning company we're over 25 permanent staff at fortula there are 50 so overall in a combination of all the companies i would say about 40 permanent staff minus the um, co um contractors which we have about over 200 of so about 40 permanent staff in all the companies across what do you do to handle the stress of that like just personally, because it's, that's 40 people and their families who depend on that paycheck and yes. you were able to keep them, but you know, cut salary. So how do you, yes. as the CEO and leader, how do you personally, like, what do you do to manage the stress? I must confess it was very tough. Um, it was very, very tough, extremely tough. Uh, at, at, at different points, I had different um, feelings. There were times I was anxious. There were times I was afraid. There were times I was, I was scared. You know, there's afraid and there's being scared. I was scared. I was scared for the future of my company. I was scared for the future of everybody working with me because I thought, what is going to happen to everyone? And what's going to even happen to this business? Can this business survive this pandemic? I was scared and I was worried, you know, and some days I would wake up in a panic. Like, oh my goodness, what is going on? Are we going to be able to make, make it out of this alive? You know, but luckily, and um, I would say, I'm, I'm a very faith-based person. I'm a Christian and I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I went to him and I cried to God. And I said to him, you need to help us. You need to help me. I can't deal with this. This is a bit much, you know? And I spoke to people. So how I dealt with it was also, Apart from speaking to God and to giving it all to him, I also surrounded myself with people. So I, was, I surrounded myself with positive people, people that were there to encourage. You know, I listened to a lot of seminars, a lot of workshops. I did not remove community from me. I made sure that I was surrounded by community. So I, my fellow event planners, my colleagues in the office, my team, my staff, I made sure we communicated. On a weekly basis, we kept in touch, you know, so that helped. 
we prayed, we, 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 we worshiped together, we shared scriptures, we learned. I, I used the opportunity to also get my team to learn new skills. I also had to learn new skills. So I realized that, you know what, this is happening and there's nothing I can do about it. I might as well get a grip and just try and make sure that we come out of this alive and we come out of this well. But what I also did as well was I looked inwards into the organization and I said, whoever wasn't pulling their weight. So um, as much as we did we were paying salaries, we redefined people's job roles. So we had to change people's JDs because there was, we were not planning events. What would everybody be doing? So everybody had to come up with ideas and plans and different things that we could do to generate income. And it was from there that we were able to get some ideas and that we generated income during the lockdown. We actually made money during the lockdown because of ideas from my team. So, but people that were not able to fit into that JD or couldn't do anything differently. As at this month, we are going to have about two or three people that are leaving because they just didn't fit into the role. They were not just, man, we tried our best, but I, you know, I said, you know what? I can't carry this weight anymore. So it was either you needed to go because you were not just pulling your weight in this period, because this is a period that everybody has to adapt. Everybody has to be resilient and you have to be flexible. So you can't say, oh, I don't know how to do it or I didn't do it. No, you have to learn how to be flexible. So that's how I was able to deal with it, you know, and also my family, you know, just being around my family. Um, when normally, you know, you're just, you know, you're working nine to five, you are always out of the house, you're traveling a lot. I had to, this also helped me to bond a little bit more, you know, with my family. And so in that process, that anxiety, all the you know, panic, everything that I was feeling became better because I started living in the moment. I started living in the moment with my family as well. So those are the things that really helped me during um, this period. Your kids got you on TikTok, right? Or to do yes. some of the dances? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. yes. oh I yes. saw them. Yes. <laughs> you mentioned that you were able to generate income during this because of ideas from your staff. What were some of the ways you were able to do that? So we did, for example, our online training. So we normally do a physical training. We are, we know in our academy, our academy, our school is actually a physical school. But we came up with the online version of it. And we got, I mean, people were very receptive of that. You know, we, of course, it was during the period as well that we, 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 we started planning intimate events, smaller events, you know, for people that couldn't um, plan an event of over 50 people or 100. So we started creating special moments, celebrations for them to be able to plan their events even in their house. Um, we also came up with like in home interiors. So, you know, everybody's going to be working from home. We started, we started doing our, so our deco arm started doing office interiors for people that we're working from home, you know, things like we never would have ever thought about. I, I mean, in my life, I never would have thought I would be doing anyone's office or, you know, if I, even the online, I know that people have been online for a long time, but I had been resisting it. But this period, you know, we all, we came online. So those were some of the things that we were able to do. The intimates, uh, plan your own event, drive by event, things like that. Those were the things that we were able to do, you know, and of course, virtual, very I fully, we went fully virtual. We went, we started planning virtual events in May. So we, we had events, weddings, celebrations that were supposed to have happened, you know, 1,000 people. And we said, you know what, you can have a virtual event. And we started having it. And that was how we were able to get people to start, you know, realizing that they needed to do those type of events. What, for your in-person events that you're doing now, I know that you're taking precautions, but can you talk a little bit about those? Because you are... The events there culturally are different. You celebrate with a lot more people than typically a lot of Western countries do. And how has guest count limits affected everything? And how do, how do your clients adapt and decide who to invite to the in-person events without hurting feelings? Because it isn't, it's a big slight not to be invited. It's not just, oh, I'll, I'll catch you on the next event, you know, like, some people really take it very personally. So how, how are your clients adapting to all of that with the things that are out of their control as far as limitations and testing and masks and all of that? Um, so what is happening is a lot of people, because of what is happening, everybody, basically, people understand that, look, it's not anybody's fault if you're not going to be invited. That's number one. Number two, people 
are also realizing that maybe they didn't even really need to have so many people for some events as they thought. Mm -hmm. um, and people also realize that they don't need to postpone it because some people have said, we're not going to postpone and we're still going to have this event. It's very tough though for anyone to, to not invite someone else. It's tough. But uh, people understand, people, people, are, people are, um, they understand. Everybody is like, you know what, we get it. We get it, actually. Oh, we get it? Oh, don't worry, don't worry. Oh, we get it. So they, what they are doing is that they are really going deep into looking at their numbers, looking at who matches the most, who is the, who is the most important person that should be there in person, and, who, and then, of course, everybody else can join online. So, and, but they're also looking at the safety of their guests. So if, yes, if you even need to be there in person, depending on your age, you may not need to be there. You may not be there because you have to be careful. Once you're over 65, the risks are higher. And once you are younger than, let's say, um, your, your young child below 18 or 15, you, the risks are also higher. So people are really being very cautious about that. And what everybody's also doing is that, you know, even with the guest list, so a guest list of 20, a guest list of 30, 50, you make sure that the people that are coming for that list you know, to that event, with, with all the safety precautions, people wash their hands before they come in, everybody wears their masks, all the, everybody that's providing, we're doing takeaway boxes now, food boxes to be given to people. People are not really eating at this event, you know, we're taking it away, things like that. That's what we are doing. Now, some people are saying, you know what, this celebration you're having is just temporary. This is for this year. We're going to have another party next year. So a lot of people actually, actually postponed. Some people even postponed their events and said, you know what? I don't have time. I'm not going to have a COVID party. I'm not having a COVID party. I want to have a party, normal party. And that's what I'm going to do next year. So I'm going to postpone. But some of them are going to do civil ceremonies. They're going to get married in the registry. And, they, they, you know, some have moved in together. Some, the bride lives abroad. The groom lives in Nigeria. They cannot get married no matter what. So they postponed it. You know, we've also done quite a lot of funerals, a lot of service of some birthdays. If I, we had, we had planned a birthday recently where the, the celebrant was in America. And it was a Zoom party. And everybody joined from all over the world. And we were the ones in Nigeria in charge of the virtual part of the event. So... It's actually even opened up more doors and everybody's realizing that, you know what, we can still celebrate without us being physically present. It's not the same. Please, I'm going to tell it. I, 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 I mean, oh Lord, I would rather be in a room where I can hug, you know, dance together. It's not the same, you know, but I mean, this is the reality now and health is more important than anything else because you want your loved ones to be alive really so people are being more are being very careful about that because they want their loved ones to be alive and so they are understanding a bit better what's the max guest count right now that you guys can have for events in person 50. events 50 people 50 people yes 50 people in lagos because we're in different states so in lagos is 50 people in other states it's more than 50 but lagos state where i stay is 50 or other states they're doing half capacity of the halls some other places are doing way bigger but for lagos state is 50 people that's how it is here in the u.s it's by state and even by county and city depending which is very confusing for people so yes it is it's extremely confusing but that's a big drop from a thousand guests yes a big drop extremely big drop <laughs> you and i met at a conference and I know you go fairly often and you speak. And what would you say to people who are considering conferences? Because I find them valuable. I know you do too. But what do you yes. say to people who, uh, because they're a big investment, not just with the registration cost, but hotel, flights, travel yes, visas. Honey. What have you gotten out of them? And then how do you, why do you think they're worth your time? And money. So it depends on your the vision for your organization. I believe that everybody has a vision and everybody has where they are going and what they want to be. So depending on where you want to be in your business will determine how far you go or where you go or what conferences you attend. And that is if you do attend conferences. For a long time, I'd said Zafai Events is a world-class organization it's a global brand and it's not just a local brand. So it's not just for Nigeria. It is for Africa and it is for the world. So it's not a local brand. It's a global brand. And how can you be global when you're only known locally? That's number one. 
Number two, you need to have something that you can give and you can learn. So it's, for me, it's about the exchange of ideas. It's about meeting new people. It's about learning things on a bigger scale. So you know things at, in your country, you know things where you are, but you need more knowledge. And you, the only way you can get more knowledge is to meet other people and listen to what they have to say. So there's a the knowledge sharing part and then there's the networking. I mean, we are on this platform today because I met you at a conference. You would never have heard of me or known me if you never met me at the conference. So, and I know you, I had always been following you before I ever met you at the conference. And for me, it was a real honor to have met you. And I'm like, oh my God. I goodness. was actually, I knew who you were. I did know oh, who I you were know. before. Yeah. You're famous. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's what it is. So it's not, it's not like sharing. It's about your vision. It's about networking, you know, and of course, exposure as well. Because for some of my team members that have actually come for these conferences, some of them have never been to maybe Dubai, America, UK, you know, they've never been to Seychelles, they've never been to Thailand. They have been exposed to international travel. And when they are even speaking to clients, they are all speaking to clients with with more exposure in their hand and with more knowledge. So for me, those are the reasons. It's, it costs money, but it's a good investment. When you look at it, I always look at it in one way. I'll say, look, you know what? If I'm paying this amount for this conference, let's say in March, I, I, I calculate it from March till the end of the year. And I use, and I break the money down per month. And I say, that's the kind of investment. So I don't look at it as one lump sum. I divide it per month, you know, and for the value that I'm going to get from it for the rest of my life. And I've been doing this for years. I've been traveling all over the world, just trying to learn more, to give more, to teach more. And also, another thing for me is also to showcase Africa to the world. Because what people, the vision of what people have of Africa, of what they have of Nigeria, is very, sometimes it's negative. So I'm like, you know what? There's a lot of positivity in my country. There's a lot of good we, 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 good things in my country there's we we are we are creative we're excellent we're we're we're, we're just amazing people and so in in my country nigeria and africa the continent we are great people so i want to show you what africa is about you know yes you see some people they're not giving you good things about africa but i want to tell you that look there's a there's good in africa and we can showcase it to you. So that's, also, that's one of the reasons why I also go for the conferences as well. There's, I think one thing people don't know maybe is that Nigeria has been the fastest growing wedding market for almost the last decade in the world, the fastest growing luxury market as well with regard to weddings. And there are a lot of talented people. And I know that for destination planners, some people like to work with local talent and some people like to bring everyone in. And I really feel like weddings, not this year because of everything, but in general, weddings have become more global, like a combination of global and local Well, people will combine that talent. And what is your, um, as far as destination weddings are concerned, how do you handle it when you produce destination events? Because Zapphire is a global brand and how do you collaborate with planners maybe who are coming in or have clients who want some of the parties there and maybe parties elsewhere? Like how do you collaborate with all that? So what we do, okay, so what we do is if we're going to do any events outside Nigeria, we usually work with, we, we work with ground, the local suppliers in those countries just to guide us and give us insight into what we need or what we, what we might need. So. I've worked with um, I, I've worked with planners, even if they are not necessarily even working on the project with me, but they've advised me, they've consulted and recommended those that I can use and the vendors I can work with, the local suppliers. So that's what we do for some events. So it depends on the location. If it's a place, for example, in in, in France, I don't speak um, French, you know. So um, in Paris, right? Um, so in France, I don't speak French. So I had to, if I, when I um, went there, you know, for an event, I had to, of course, work with the local um, planners there or local suppliers who understood English to help me 
you know, with translations and communication and things like that. You know, in Dubai, when we did events in Dubai, we also worked with local suppliers there, but of course, L Dubai is more tourism focused. So they were ready, readily available to help. So what, those are some of the things that we, we've done. So in most of the places that we've gone to do plan events in Cape Town, in Joburg, in the UK, we've worked with the local suppliers there, either based on recommendations from my fellow colleagues that are planners, or um, you know, a fellow decorator, you know, and we've worked with them. Or sometimes we work, the, the, the local suppliers actually are the ground people that are the main people. And then I just come and act as a consultant because of the Nigerian culture. So I have to just guide you on, you know, nuances, what not to say, what to say, how to behave because it's a Nigerian event, you know, things like that. Now, when they come to Nigeria to get married, I also work with their planner that is coming as well. And I guide or I may be the lead planner. So it just depends on what it is. But that's how we work when we do go um, for destination events internationally. What are you most looking forward to when this is all over? Wow. I'm just looking forward to more celebrations. I'm looking forward to us not being af as afraid. You know, like I'm looking forward to giving people many hugs, you know, and nobody's scared that, oh, um, don't come near me, greet me with the elbow, remove your mask. Are you, do you have COVID or you don't have COVID? Um, I'm looking forward to celebrations. I'm looking forward to more joyous moment. Um, it's been very gloomy uh, because we've lost so many people. So many people, even in my industry, passed away. Um, so many of my friends' parents um, my friends, my own, you know, people that I know passed away. So it's been very gloomy. So I'm just looking forward to, to more joy. Um, I'm looking forward to events also being done a bit differently. I think that what COVID has done as well is that it's opened up our eyes to new way of doing things. So I'm looking forward to that type, you know, those events that maybe things that we thought couldn't happen, you know, and now can happen. So those are the things I'm looking for. I'm just looking forward to happier moments and more joyous moments. I think that just for the event professionals or for, for everyone that, you know, has been affected or everyone that has been part of this, you know, the industry has been hit, you know, apart from the, of course, the tourism industry, the hospitality industry, um, the industry that has been hit almost the most, I would say, is also the event industry. So right. what I just want to say to everyone, you know, just even for myself and to all my colleagues that I always say is that in every crisis, there's always an opportunity. So it's just left for us to find the opportunities and also even going forward when all this is over, looking for how we will do things differently. So how can we do things differently? What can we advise our clients better? Um, how can we make events um, not the usual way? So I think that what it is that we've also been going in a particular pattern with events. So this is like a pause for us to be able to rethink how we do events. Also, I would also want to say, you know, to even, you know, to anyone, you know, to anyone, you know, listening or watching or just even just be really, being really, really discouraged that this moment, a moment for us, as much as I know that a lot of people, even during this lockdown, they reworked their processes, they reworked a lot of their structure, they redefined their vision, their mission. You know, we all did that, you know, in order to come out differently. So what I would just want to say to anyone or to even to me, this is for me, is that whatever it is, you will come out a better you. And that even if you have to rework your business a little bit, rework your business model a little bit, you will still do well because you are the creative person. You are the one that has ideas. You are the one that, you know, can always come up with new innovations and nobody else can do that. So whatever it is you're, you're going through, just know that you, it will be fine. It's tough. It's tough. Oh my goodness. It's extremely tough. But at the same time, um, it's just a way for us to rethink how we do events and how we also, you know, come. And then also another thing also as well is that, we also, we need to also look inwards a little bit more. So I think what I mean inwards, I'm talking about even in our countries. So for Nigeria, for example, I've said to a lot of my, my colleagues, it's high time that we look at Nigeria as a place that people want to come to 
and celebrate, not a place that people want to leave and go. So we need to also look inwards. How can we make everything better in our country that people want to come in? Even the people that are here don't have to travel to go out and get married or plan an event. You know, they can do it here because of what they see that is beautiful here. And the same way for anyone in any other countries as well. Because travel is, is for now, is going to is a bit of a nightmare as, as far as I'm concerned with all the tests that one has to do. So if you don't absolutely have to travel, then stay in your country and, you know, just make it amazing. 